computer. Ah, got it. Okay. Um, Can you all see the share screen now? Yeah, we can. Yeah, okay. looking good. And there we are. Okay. Okay, hey, hopefully it's recording. Thanks. Okay, as I was saying, I've been uh, uh, a scientist both at UBC and with Fisheries and Oceans Canada. And since retirement, I've been working with NGOs to push our governments to act on climate change. And I've been teaching courses on climate change through Elder College. I'm extremely concerned about what the future holds for our children and especially our grandchildren, unless we get serious about climate change and biodiversity conservation. Hence my delight at being invited to give this talk. We're all travelers on a train that is experiencing two slow moving wrecks. And each of these wrecks is capable of doing humanity great harm. These wrecks are respectively the biodiversity crisis and the climate crisis. Sheltered as we Canadians are in the first class section, we are only just beginning to notice these train wrecks. But as they unfold, even we in first class will experience their impact. These unfolding wrecks will touch on every part of our lives and every aspect of society. The poor, poor nations and poor people will suffer much more than we wealthy people in wealthy nations because of course wealth brings power and protection. Whether the changes to our ecosystems and to our climate become as great as climate science predicts, even very wealthy people will feel their impact. What I've said so far may sound alarmist. It was meant to alarm you. United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres has declared that both the climate crisis and the biodiversity crisis are existential threats to humanity and that both are getting worse. Just so there's no confusion, existential in his statement means a threat to the existence of humanity. We don't like to think about that. We don't really believe it's possible. But every species eventually runs its course and disappears. There's no reason to think ours will dodge the inevitable extinction bullet. But I expect we would all like it to be later rather than sooner. For that reason alone, we should pay attention to the scientists and leaders like Guterres who warn us that we're on a dangerous path. We should try to understand why these respected people are making such dire predictions. They are not crackpots pitching some kind of doomsday nonsense for personal gain. They're individuals who have devoted their lives to helping humanity live better, healthier lives. In this photo, Guterres is telling the billionaires at the Devil's Economic Forum that their kids understand the serious situation we're in, whereas the supposed adults to whom he is speaking do not. He's not quite as blunt as Greta Thunberg was, telling members of the UN General Assembly that all they did is dream about money and fantasies of growth, but it comes to the same thing. We are in a train wreck, but the speed at which it is happening is so slow, so languid, that the unfolding wreck seems unreal. And it is virtually noiseless. Until recently, there was no sound, no events to remind us that we were experiencing a crash up. The wrecks have still not impacted as much. That makes it simpler just to pretend they are not happening. And with a few exceptions, this pretending seems to be the consensus position of the world's leaders. Because you don't hear any squeal of brakes, do you? At least I don't. In fact, according to Guterres, although we are in the middle of a crash, most leaders still have their foot pushing hard on the accelerator. And sadly, that includes Prime Minister Trudeau. And were Mr. Polyev to succeed him, I'm sure he would push just as hard. Oh, hear me. So what is this lecture all about? What I've said so far must make it seem as though it will be all doom and gloom. The subject is indeed scary. However, I'm going to try to make it as positive as possible. And although the situation is bad, it is fixable. 
We can fix the climate and rebuild biodiversity if we pay attention and make the right choices. My subject, climate change and biodiversity loss, is on the one hand rather simple and on the other large and complex. So in this talk, I will be summarizing a great deal of information, but still I will be leaving a lot out. Hopefully the main points will be pretty clear. First, I'll briefly describe the crisis of biodiversity loss and why it's important. Second, I'll briefly describe the crisis of climate change and why it's important. The climate crisis and the biodiversity crises are strongly interlinked. It's hard to talk about one without invoking the other. Third, I will briefly introduce the global and local actions that are being taken to address these twin crises. Spoiler alert, these actions have so far been almost completely unsuccessful. Mostly this is because so few nations have really taken either crisis seriously. Those that have, like Costa Rica, are a beacon of hope because they show us what can be done if we take action. And thankfully, more nations are beginning to respond to the crises. Last, I will dive a little deeper into the crises by discussing how they're impacting two of our local iconic ecosystems, the Douglas fir ecosystem and the Pacific salmon ecosystem. These two ecosystems are deeply intertwined in DC. They're a marvelous illustration of the ecological adage that everything is connected to everything else. They also lovely, beautifully illustrate the beautiful, beauty and intricacy of the biodiversity that we are losing all too rapidly. Let's begin with biodiversity. The word biodiversity refers to the amazing variety of life on earth and all of its forms and interrelationships. Some definitions include genetic variation as part of biodiversity. And some definitions include the variation in landforms and seascapes that structure local biological communities. But at its simplest, biodiversity is the great variety of life on Earth. It is comprised of something like 9 million species of animals and plants, plus millions upon millions more unicellular or prokaryotic, prokaryotic organisms, such as bacteria and archaea. Keep in mind that only a small fraction of all this diversity of organisms has actually been described and named by science. Fewer still have been studied in any detail. The biodiversity crisis therefore refers to the disappearance of life forms that are mostly completely unknown to science. We scientists are experiencing great anxiety over the disappearance of these life forms. Our anxiety rests on the knowledge that the species you know something about are critically important to humanity. And we assume that those we don't know are similarly important. It is as if we had read a few pages of some fabulous books in a grand library only to realize that the whole library is ablaze. Biodiversity exists within a thin layer of soil, water, and air that constitutes the biosphere. Within this thin layer, which is only about 20 kilometers deep, conditions on Earth are sufficient to sustain life. And in practical terms, only about half a layer or 10 kilometers is comfortable for life. Setting boundaries is always risky. Bacteria can be found deep in the earth and high in the atmosphere, but we could put broader limits on the biosphere. But as far as humanity is concerned, this 10 or 20 kilometer skin of biosphere should suffice. Considering that the earth is 12,750 kilometers in diameter, the layer suitable for life is less than paper thin. Why should we care about biodiversity? Unless you're a naturalist and ecologist like me or a keen outdoors person, your interactions with biodiversity are probably limited and mostly indirect. You probably don't even notice most of those interactions. And biodiversity is not something many of us learn anything about in school either. Nor is it important in today's curriculum. Right now in BC, students in grade three are the only ones who get any introduction to biodiversity. But the biodiversity of life on Earth provides many, many, many services to humankind, services that keep us alive on this beautiful planet. First of all, biodiversity provides us with clean air, pure water, and uncontaminated food, all pretty important on a day-to-day -day basis. 
Of course, humans make some effort to clean up the mess of waste, pollutants, and poisons we continually dump into the air and water and onto the land. And this cleanup often costs us billions. But what we do in the way of cleanup is infinitesimal compared to what biodiversity does and the biosphere and the biosphere, what they do for free. Without the cleanup provided by the biosphere, we would have poisoned ourselves to death long ago. Of course, there are always things that we produce and discard that the biosphere cannot break up, that break down in a reasonable time. Plastics and legacy chemicals are just two examples. And these tend to pile up until they become a major problem, like plastics are today. The important thing for everyone to understand, however, is that without the services provided by the biosphere, we are toast. That alone should make us anxious to predict biodiversity. Second, the biosphere provides many products important in our everyday lives, primarily food and fiber. If you like to eat and stay warm, then biodiversity is pretty important. As with other areas of life, humans have intervened in the food and fiber area in an attempt to insulate and sometimes isolate humanity from its dependence on the biosphere. In the case of fibers, we've been somewhat successful. We produce a broad variety of synthetic fibers from petroleum products, but natural fibers like cotton and linen are still popular and important. And of course, petroleum, the raw material of synthetic fibers, was originally plant material produced by the biosphere. So even for our clothing, we still need the biosphere. And of course, we should not forget the microplastic hazard associated with synthetic fibers. We've been much less successful at producing food without a diversity of services from the biosphere. In fact, our industrialized food production system is doing a lot of damage to the biosphere and to biodiversity through its use of chemical fertilizers, poisons, and its mechanical damage to the integrity of the soil. Modern industrial agriculture is, in fact, not sustainable. Among other things, we need to find a more ecologically friendly way to produce our food. Third, the biosphere helps keep us sane. Growing plants release a variety of chemicals into the air and generate a biophysical environment that helps calm us emotionally. The industrial West with its high-tech medicine generally discounts this service provided free by the biosphere. However, a growing number of well-designed studies demonstrate that persons suffering from an illness or physical damage like a broken arm heal significantly faster if they have contact with nature, even if it's only visual contact. Studies in hospitals show that patients in wards with windows that show a view of trees or a park recover significantly faster than patients in wards without windows or with windows that have only a view of buildings. Children suffering from emotional distress are visibly calm that they're taken into a forest where they can experience the sights, sounds, and smells of nature. So the biosphere and biodiversity are important to humanity in many, many ways. This life-giving biosphere has been dramatically altered by human activity. This slide summarizes how humans have altered land use and land cover over the past 6,000 years. First, we removed forest cover to create land for agriculture. More recently, land has been devoted to large cities and their associated infrastructure. Right now, only about 25% of the ice-free land on Earth is in natural vegetation. The rest has all been converted to other kinds of ecosystems, ecosystems that are much less biologically diverse than wild ecosystems and which provide many fewer services to humankind. More than 50% of natural forests are gone. The majority of natural grasslands have been converted to cropland or pasture. Human changes, in the land with its associated biodiversity loss is one aspect of the train wrecks into which we're cruising and the other aspect is climate change. Climate change refers to the unintentional change in the Earth's climate caused primarily by humans extracting and burning fossil fuels, thereby releasing millions of tons of greenhouse gases, primarily carbon dioxide, into the atmosphere. Two other human activities that contribute significantly to climate change are industrial agriculture and industrial logging. 
The most apparent consequence of human-caused climate change is the rising average temperature of the land and water shown in the graph on the lower right. Temperatures of the earth have increased about 1.2 degrees centigrade since 1850. Associated with this rising temperature are changing weather patterns, which include more severe rainstorms, more severe droughts, and more severe extreme weather events of all sorts. Linked to the changing weather patterns are more serious wildfires and more serious floods. The rising global temperature is melting glaciers and ice caps, causing the sea level to rise and exacerbating coastal flooding. The increasing carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is also causing the sea to become more acid, negatively affecting numerous forms of marine life like corals and shellfish that build shells and calcium dissolved in the ocean. The graph of rising temperature on this slide also shows that the global temperature increase is accelerating, which means that things are getting worse faster and faster, as Mr. Guterres has said. The rising temperature and changing weather patterns associated with climate change are having important negative effects on biodiversity, disrupting reproduction patterns and food resources for many species. At the same time, of course, these changes are killing humans and destroying human infrastructure. Changing climate is not the only global change caused by humans. The global impacts of humanity are in fact ever expanding. As I mentioned, humans have significantly altered 75% of the land surface, transforming forest to grassland, grassland to pasture and croplands, and these lands into urban land. In addition to that, 66% of the ocean area is experiencing increasing cumulative impacts from human activities such as overfishing, pollution, and species loss. Over 85% of wetland areas has been lost to draining and infilling. These wetlands were critical storehouses of carbon and amazing water filters. They're also among the most biologically productive areas on earth and we've destroyed most of them. Approximately half the live coral on coral reefs has been lost since the 1870s due to physical destruction, pollution, and bleaching caused by climate change. And these losses are accelerating. Like wetlands, coral reefs are incredibly productive ecosystems and also critical nursery habitats for many marine fishes. The abundance of native species in major terrestrial biomes has fallen by 20% or more since 1900. In particular, wild vertebrates have declined dramatically over the last 50 years in all biomes. Mal mammals have been particularly hard hit, their numbers falling by as much as 50% in many locations. The global trend in insect populations is downward and rapid declines in insects are well documented in some regions. I'm sure that you've all noticed that you no longer collect a scum of insect bodies on your windshield and the grill of your car when you go for a drive these days. And that's a global phenomenon. Unfortunately, measuring biodiversity loss is not straightforward. Species extinction is a primary signal. And in this, in this graph on the left, we see that recent rates of extinction among amphibians, mammals, birds, insects, and fishes have been quite high. But being certain that a species has actually gone extinct is not always easy. Many species have been reduced to such low numbers that individuals are seldom seen. And even though we are currently losing species at a high rate, whether this will continue, get worse or get better is not at all certain. And since only a small fraction of the total species on earth have actually been described, we can't be at all certain that about overall extinction rates. Only in the case of birds and mammals have most species been described and named. Nevertheless, known species extinction show that the current rate of extinction is very high compared to the background rate. Some scientists are even arguing that we're entering a sixth great extinction. Much biodiversity lost by extinction goes virtually unnoticed by most people. For example, insect disappearance has recently become a focus of research on climate effects on biodiversity. 
We know that insect populations are declining worldwide. The first published report came from the Entomological Society in Krefeld, Germany in 2017. Their data showed a 76% decline in insects over 27 years of sampling in protected areas. Their report galvanized entomologists to begin pulling together data from other geographic areas. Now numerous other studies have confirmed a worldwide decline in insect abundance and recent studies project a 40% loss of species by 2100. Should you care? Setting aside entomologists, practically no one likes insects. We spend hundreds of millions of dollars each year spraying poisons around to get rid of insects. Some insects are, of course, vectors of serious diseases like malaria and dengue fever. However, insects are also a primary food resource in most ecosystems and the majority of insects are beneficial. Without insects, nature as we know it would collapse. What do insects do for us though? 80% of wild plants and 75% of crops depend on insects for pollination. 60% of birds rely on insects as a food source, as do many other small vertebrates, small mammals, lizards, frogs. Insects are an important food source too, in many less developed human communities. The ecosystem services provided by wild insects in the United States have been valued at 57 billion each year. And globally, the value of insect services is many times this amount. Annoying as they sometimes are, we need insects. So if you do nothing else for biodiversity, I urge you to do something for pollinators like bees and hoverflies. So what are we doing? What's the global community doing about the crises, twin crises of climate change and biodiversity loss? In 1992, international leaders assembled in Rio de Janeiro for the so-called Earth Summit. At this meeting, the assembled leaders of the world signed on to the United Nations Convention on Biodiversity thereby committing to make meaningful to take meaningful action to curb biodiversity loss. At the same meeting, the same leaders signed on to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, thereby committing to take meaningful action to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. These signatures were the first global acknowledgement that the world was in trouble, that we were changing the climate in ways that would be disastrous for humanity, that we were changing the biosphere and causing organisms to go extinct in ways that would have uncertain but likely very adverse consequences for humanity. The assembled leaders agreed that we had to stop doing these things, stop emitting greenhouse gases, stop causing species to go extinct, to dial down on our transformation of the biosphere. Our prime minister, Brian Mulroney, was front and if not center, highly visible and very active at the Earth Summit. Sadly, the subsequent actions of world leaders have not lived up to the promises made at the 1992 meeting. Greenhouse gas emissions have continued to soar. Biosphere changing, species killing behaviors have continued to pace. Greenhouse gas emissions are on track to raise global temperature three degrees centigrade or more by the end of the century. Twice what climate, change, climate science estimates is the safe amount. And as things are going, temperature increase will not stop there. Transformation of the, of the landscape to meet perceived human needs is accelerating and squeezing out other species. In 2019, shortly before the COVID pandemic hit, the Intergovernmental Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services reported that 1 million species, more than 10% of known species are threatened with extinction. Global meetings subsequent to 1992 have produced more promises. In 2010, for example, world leaders agreed to five modest targets to address biodiversity loss, Daiichi targets, which were to be achieved by 2020. These targets were, first of all, to mainstream biodiversity sorry, conservation across government and society basically to include consideration of the consequences for biodiversity in every policy decision. Second, to reduce the direct pressure on biodiversity and promote sustainable use, 
worldwide. Thirdly, to adopt effective policies to safeguard ecosystems, species, and genetic diversity. Fourthly, to enhance the benefits to everyone from biodiversity and ecosystem services. And fifth, to promote broad implementation of these strategies through participatory planning and capacity building. None of these targets was achieved by 2020. In December 22, 2022, uh, dignitaries to the Convention on Biodiversity set new conservation targets at their conventional parties in Montreal. These targets included, first of all, to protect 30% of land, freshwater, and marine ecosystems. Second, to redouble efforts to prevent introduction of harmful and invasive species globally. Thirdly, to dramatically reduce the amount of fertilizer and pesticides that were lost to the environment in agriculture. And finally, to finance biodiversity protection in developing nations. We won't know for some time if any of these targets will be achieved globally, but past performance suggests that progress will be limited. So what has Canada done? Canada was an early signatory to the Convention on Biodiversity and also to the uh, Convention on Climate Change. However, Canada has made only modest progress in implementing the principles of the Biodiversity Convention. In Montreal, Canada also pushed hard for the recent agreement at COP15 whether Canada can meet its commitments to protect 30% of land and water remains to be seen. Part of the problem in Canada is the lack of clear authority for environmental matters. Both the federal and provincial governments claim authority, but in my opinion, neither really takes responsibility. Today, Indigenous views must also guide policy and programs, which I think is a good thing, but it adds to the complexity of reaching any agreement. In the past, of course, Indigenous interests were generally ignored. But even where it has clear authority, Canada's performance in the environment has been lackluster. Provinces are a mixed bag. Some have done okay, but others show no interest in doing anything. Quebec has often led the pack with good legislation and policy. BC's record is mixed, but it's fair to say that where economic interests and biodiversity conservation conflict, economic interests tend to win. So I want to turn attention now to two BC ecosystems and species groups that are in serious trouble. I expect you're familiar with these ecosystems, Douglas fir forests and Pacific salmon. Coastal and interior Douglas fir forests are a critical economic resource in BC but also a critical biodiversity resource. The natural lifespan of a Douglas fir is 600 to 800 years. And when European colonists arrived 300 years ago, old growth fir hemlock forests were commonplace along the mountain slopes of the coast and along the Western slopes of the Rocky Mountains. Only a tiny percentage of these old forests remains. The removal of these forests has had a major effect on biodiversity. Even where logged forests have been replanted, Young forests have a dramatically different faunal composition than do old growth. The upper graph on the right of this slide shows that diversity of species is greater in unlogged areas of forest. The different uh, symbols under the different patterns of logging here refer to different forest patches in slightly different uh, climate zones but doesn't matter climate zone, uh, where you take away the trees, uh, the biodiversity falls compared to unlogged areas of the same forest. The lower graph shows that the number of microhabitats in a fir forest is related to the size of the trees in the forest. Larger trees and forests with larger trees have many more microhabitats and so provide living space for many more species. These microhabitats not only provide living space, but they also diversify the local microclimate 
and within each microhabitat. And this again provides additional opportunity for a wide variety of organisms uh, to thrive. The forest of Douglas fir that's several hundred years old is a very different ecosystem from a young forest. The complexity, complexity of the ecosystem extends from the forest crown down to the ground and throughout the root system. The forest can be described as a layered ecosystem. The crown, the tree trunks, the ground level biocommunity, and the soil are each an ecosystem in its own right. And each of these subsystems connects with and exchanges materials and energy with the other layers in the system. The crown, for example, is the locus of primary production in the forest, generating a new organic material that feeds all parts of the tree and many organism, organisms that live with the tree and on the forest floor. Transpiration from the needles keeps the air in the crown moist and the temperature there is several degrees cooler than either above or below the crown. The branches in the crown of an old growth fir forest are festooned with lichens and mosses. Now take a look at that little inset picture to the right. This is from a branch fallen from an older Douglas fir. And these foliose and fruticose lichens contain cyanobacteria that fix nitrogen from the air. Nitrogen tends to be a limiting nutrient in fir forests, and the lichens in the canopy make a significant contribution of nitrogen uh, to the nutrient budget of the forest. These lichens also tend to get blown out of the crown during windstorms and fall to the ground. On the ground, they provide food for deer, mammals, insects, and other species, as well as additional nutrients to the soil as they decompose. Speaking of insects, over 400 species live in the crown of a mature forest, and 100 of those are unique to Douglas fir forests. Crown biodiversity is much lower in young forests. In addition, many bird species feed and nest in the crown, including bald eagles, crossbills, and spotted owls, and marbled murrelets. The crown is also home to several small mammals, such as the red-backed vole, the Douglas squirrel, and pine marten. Red-backed voles in particular may spend many generations in the crown of an old tree without ever venturing to the ground. The trunks of the large trees with their thick, deeply crevassed bark provide another structurally complex habitat with its own suite of plants, mosses, lichens, spiders, and birds. Pileated woodpeckers, for example, focus on the trunks of dead trees to provide both feeding and nesting habitat. The red backed vole and the Douglas squirrel also occupy this ecosystem. The forest floor littered with fallen tree trunks and with its own community of understory plants and animals is another separate ecosystem layer. In older mature forests, most of the soil nutrients are bound up in living trees or in the decomposing fallen trees on the forest floor. Also, the large old trees in a mature forest tend to be much more widely spaced than in a young developing forest, so there are more places where light can reach the forest floor. A diversity of shrubs like salal, Oregon grape, huckleberry uh, grow on the partially shaded forest floor, as well as numerous herbs, mosses, and ferns. Young trees also frequently grow on the fallen logs but they get first access to nutrients released as the logs slowly decomposed. The crisscross deadfalls on the forest floor create a physically complex habitat where raccoons, mice, weasels, and mink find secure places to live. Larger predators like puma and bear also roam this ecosystem looking for food. Beneath the soil surface, the network of tree roots interlinked, sorry, interlinked and interconnected by mycorrhizal fungi creates yet another ecosystem with a great diversity of little known insects, other arthropods, nematode worms, and burrowing species like shrews. Although each layer from crown to soil is a fully functioning ecosystem, the layers also interconnect to comprise a complete forest ecosystem. These forests grow and thrive within a particular local climate and that climate is changing as climate changes. Climate change will change the distribution of conditions favorable for Douglas fir throughout the province. This slide, which is based on climate modeling, shows how some areas will lose suitability for fir 
whereas others will become more suitable. Assuming climate change unfolds as expected, there will actually be more area of the province suitable for Douglas fir toward the end of the century than there is now. This looks like good news for the forest industry. But keep in mind that it takes close to 100 years to grow a marketable Douglas fir, even longer if we want to recapture the complexity of old growth. The transition of the forest will be slow and messy. And assuming we are able to stabilize climate and perhaps even begin pushing it back, the situation for fir forests will remain fluid and unstable and messy for a long time. Forests are likely to suffer continuing harm for many human generations, regardless of how we address climate change. Let's move on to Pacific salmon, which are arguably the most iconic species for many people in British Columbia. We have five different species of salmon in BC. Six of you include steelhead trout, which were put into the same genus as Pacific salmon several decades ago. Just as the fir forest is a multifaceted ecosystem interconnected by trees and mycorrhizal fungi, the salmon ecosystem is multifaceted and interconnected by water and salmon. All five species of salmon follow a similar life history pattern. They spawn in fresh water in the autumn, hatch in the early spring. They either migrate to sea at once or spend a few months to a few years in fresh water before migrating to sea. Once in the sea, they migrate and feed in coastal and offshore waters for a year or several years before migrating back to freshwater to spawn. The ecosystem of Pacific salmon includes all of the North Pacific Ocean and part of the Arctic Ocean, plus the major continental and coastal river systems where salmon spawn. The ecosystems of salmon and Douglas fir therefore intersect. I roughly outlined the terrestrial part of BC that comprises the spawning habitat for BC salmon. The five species each use marine waters somewhat differently. Coho and large numbers of Chinook spend most of their ocean life in coastal waters over the continental shelf, whereas pink chum and sockeye spend most of their marine life in the open ocean. Salmon from the Russian Far East and from Japan occupy the Western North Pacific, overlapping and intermingling with North American salmon during marine life. The principal foods of the different salmon in fresh water and in the ocean are also different. In most cases, pink and chum salmon migrate to sea as soon as they emerge in spring, and so do not feed in fresh water. Most coho and chinook spend their freshwater life in rivers and streams where they feed mainly on insect larvae. Sockeye spend their freshwater life in lakes where they feed mainly on zooplankton. In the ocean, pink, sockeye, and chum are primarily plankton eaters, whereas coho and chinook are more pecivorous. All five salmon species are important in the food webs of their freshwater nurseries and in their ocean habitats. As fry and juveniles in freshwater, they're an important food source for birds and small mammals such as dippers, mink, and otters, as well as numerous fish species. Many seabirds depend heavily on juvenile salmon and coastal waters to feed their young in spring and early summer. Predation by salmon on marine zooplankton and fishes like sand lance and herring plays an important role in structuring oceanic plankton communities. Maturing salmon are an important food source for marine mammals of various sorts and for sharks. Maturing salmon returning to spawn were a critical food source for indigenous peoples before colonization and remain an important economic resource. Commercial salmon harvest was once a premier fishery in BC, but catches have been dwindling for 30 years, primarily due to habitat loss and degradation, and more recently to climate change. Recent salmon harvests throughout the North Pacific, however, are larger than ever because of very effective hatchery production of pink salmon in Alaska and the Russian Far East, and good natural production of sockeye in Alaska and Russia. What we have lost, though, is the great variety of small runs to every local creek and river that once received salmon and contributed immensely to local biological diversity. Indigenous people have told me that their parents or grandparents used to be able to go to the local streams and find salmon most months of the year. This diversity of habitat use is now virtually non-existent. Climate change is changing both the freshwater and marine habitats of salmon in ways that are not favorable to salmon south of Alaska. 
Increasing temperatures in freshwater and changing river flow patterns are affecting the reproductive success of salmon, while changing ocean temperatures, like the hot blob that appeared off our coast in 2014 to 2020, dramatically reduced the ocean survival of salmon, particularly from British Columbia. The ocean habitats used by salmon have specific temperature characteristics. That is to say, salmon occupy a particular ocean thermal regime. As surface temperatures increase in the North Pacific Ocean, the ocean area within the acceptable temperature range for salmon is shrinking. Projections of future temperature increase if they come to pass will squeeze salmon into a smaller and smaller area of the Pacific Ocean. As this slide shows, it was moved from the 1980s to the 2040s and the 2080s. Uh, the zone of the Pacific that's suitable temperature for salmon is shrinking. Uh, whereas there's a corresponding increase in suitable temperature areas in the Arctic. Salmon are already colonizing the Arctic Ocean to a greater extent than in the past and moving into Arctic water rivers to spawn. As global temperatures rise, the Arctic Ocean may become a final refuge for Pacific salmon. Salmon returning to spawn not only provide an economic bonanza to fishermen, they also feed a broad array of birds and mammals like humans, wait eagerly for the nutrition they will provide. Grizzly bears, for example, spend heavily on salmon runs to lay down the fat they need for successful hibernation. Meanwhile, thousands of spawned out salmon carcasses left in the streams decompose and fertilize the stream, ensuring an abundant insect and plankton food supply for future juvenile salmon. The carcasses that are hauled into the bush by bears and other mammals fertilize the riparian vegetation along the stream bank. Bears through feeding on salmon, defecating and urinating in the bush, contribute about 30 kilograms of nitrogen per bear per year to the riparian forests. This nitrogen subsidy comes from the ocean. It's stored in the tissues of the salmon as they grow in the ocean and then brought back to the natal stream during the spawning run. Species like Douglas fir and salmon are considered keystone species in the ecosystems they occupy. A keystone species is a species that has unusually large impact on the species composition, structure, and function of the ecosystem. With the fir trees, it's the physical structure they give to the forest ecosystem and the way their discharge of water into the canopy stabilizes and reduces canopy temperature, making a more suitable habitat for a range of insects and small mammals, as well as their function as primary producers, creating abundant nutritious food for insects and other herbivores in their needles, as well as platforms in which nitrogen-fixing lichens grow, thus contributing to the nutrient balance of the forest. Salmon impact their freshwater and marine environments in numerous ways. They rework stream, they rework stream substrates during red construction, Spawning salmon, as I mentioned, deliver an important food source to terrestrial animals, insects, and other creatures, as well as a nutrient subsidy to repairing forests and stream ecosystems. Juvenile salmon feeding in freshwater structures the freshwater invertebrate and insect community. Likewise, salmon are an important food source for many marine predators and through their own feeding on marine organisms, help structure those marine communities. Loss or significant reduction in the abundance or change in distribution of these species will have profound effects on the overall structure and function of Pacific Rim forests and the North Pacific Ocean, as well as huge consequences for indigenous people and fisheries around the Pacific Rim. Now let's take a look at the actions we could take that will most do most to halt and reverse climate change. Both climate change and biodiversity loss are huge global problems that no individual nation can solve. It's easy to feel overwhelmed and impotent in the face of these global changes that are driven by the engines of our economy. Unless we take action soon to forge a new social contract among nations that privileges and protects the climate and biodiversity, we surely face a future that, to quote Thomas Hobbes, could become nasty, brutish, and short. The good news is we have the technology and the knowledge to transform our economies and our society to protect and restore both the climate and biodiversity. It won't be easy, it won't be painless, and it won't be free, 
but there's no reason for us simply to sit on our comfortable chairs and let the developing train wrecks consume us. So I'm gonna finish with a few ideas about exercising the power that all of you have to help push our governments and everyone else toward the necessary changes. With regard to climate change, numerous research studies have shown which actions will have the greatest impact in reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Some of these are actions individuals can take. Others require significant government or private sector engagement. First of all, and most importantly, we need to transition our economies to renewable forms of energy and electrify everything, especially transportation. We can do this, we just have to get over our wet love affair with fossil fuels. Secondly, we should reduce the amount of red meat in our diets and eat more plants, particularly in wealthy countries where uh, red meat is in very high demand. We must protect all remaining old growth forest and reforest land that is marginal for agriculture. Thankfully, this is already happening in well-developed countries. And there are uh, organizations that are pushing for this in developing countries as well. Indeed, in some developing countries, the farmers have taken it on themselves uh, to do this, to improve the quality of the soil through uh, replanting of trees. We must adopt farming methods that restore soil fertility, such as mixed crop farming, silver pasture, regenerative agriculture, and lower no-till agriculture. Again, this is happening, but it needs to happen on a much larger scale than it has up to this point. We must reduce excessive use of fertilizers and pesticides in agriculture. We need to promote and fund education for girls and women in developing countries. Educated women have fewer babies and contribute more to the economy. I haven't said anything about the contribution of the 8 billion human population of the problems we face today, but they are a significant contributor. We must promote and fund reproductive health for women, including family planning and contraception everywhere. We must protect the remaining global wetlands and peatlands and restore wetlands where possible, and to the extent possible, help bring back coral reefs. Like climate, biodiversity loss can be reversed and solved. Solving the climate crisis is part of the solution to biodiversity loss. Climate change is only one of the many drivers of biodiversity loss, but climate change is increasing in importance as every day goes by. In some regions, such as the Amazon, we may be approaching a tipping point where biodiversity loss will become virtually unstoppable. We have to hope that that will not happen. All of you have more power than you imagine especially collectively, but even working alone, you can have an impact. Here are some individual actions that can bear fruit. Your vote is your most powerful tool for bringing about political action. Go through the platforms of the parties and individuals seeking election at all levels to see if they're proposing meaningful action on climate change our biodiversity loss and vote accordingly. Attend all candidates meetings before elections and ask questions about climate and biodiversity. Let the candidates know that their responses are important to securing your vote. Talk to your friends and relatives about climate change and biodiversity loss, why it matters and what solutions are available. Surveys show that a high percentage of Canadians are very concerned about climate change and biodiversity loss. But these same surveys show that people don't talk to one another about it. So talk it up. If you go to church, ask the minister to give, to give a sermon or sermons on biodiversity and climate change. Help him or her write it if need be. Encourage your municipal and regional governments to support biodiversity conservation. They are important but often ignored players. It's quite likely they don't even think that Climate change and biodiversity are part of their mandate. Write to politicians and to the press, telling them what needs to happen. Send praise when they do something right and criticism when they don't. If you have a lawn, get rid of it. 
I know people are often very proud of their lovely green lawns, but lawns support very little biodiversity and keeping them clean and green demands lots of fertilizer and herbicides. We landscape with perennial native plants that are good for pollinators and birds. I know this picture doesn't illustrate that, but uh, you know what I mean. Compost your organic waste as a natural fertilizer for your native plant garden or your vegetable garden. Stall rain barrels to catch roof runoff for watering. Purchase foodstuffs locally as much as you can. Work locally to promote green space and native species conservation. For example, why not promote a Know Your Wild Plants Day at your children's or grandchildren's school? Again, surveys show that few adults or children can recognize and identify more than one or two native plants. We could have a hand in changing that. Biodiversity conservation is all about discovering or rediscovering our deep connection with nature. As my mother used to tell me, we should all work for the best outcomes, but it's still a good idea to learn the edible plants. As they say, the future is in our hands. The world is counting on us to help it through these crises to stop the train before the wrecks become a complete disaster. Thank you all. Okay, thank you, Michael. And at this stage, we're going to uh, open it up for questions. I'm not sure if uh, Michael is still with us. Michael, are you there? Yeah, I am. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, I can hear you. Um, I'm looking at a Zoom screen. Um, I get, I, I'll get out of this. Yeah. Okay. There we are. Okay. There oh. we are now. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So why don't we get everybody to uh, turn on their videos? and to uh, unmute themselves. And uh, this is an opportunity for some questions or comments. It's a very, very interesting presentation, Michael. Thank you. Um, somewhat uh, uh, alarming. M Michael, I'll, I'll just start off with a comment. I don't know if it, there was one quote that really struck me from you the whole presentation. I don't know if it's your quote or not, or somebody else's, but it's a good one. And here it is. Wildlife is precious from the moment of extinction. <laughs> yeah, that, that was the the, uh, uh, the caption on one of the cartoons I stuck in. Uh, it's a picture of a fellow with a stars and stripes hat with a background of... Uh, skeletal structures from animals. And he's saying that, you know, he's basically arguing we, we don't pay any attention to uh, wildlife until it disappears. And that unfortunately is many times true. Yeah, so much truth there. <laughs> Michael? Yes? Um, you mentioned microplastics and things. I'm yeah. curious what you consider legacy chemicals. Yes, well, legacy chemicals are chemicals that break down. hang around in the environment virtually forever um, that um, we have been releasing into the environment for uh, many, generations, sometimes without even noticing it. Now, recently, we've become quite aware of microplastics, but mm -hmm. we've been using plastics for a long time. Mm -hmm. And they've been busy sloughing off microplastics for as long as they've been around. OK, thank you. Uh, just to carry on from what uh, Michael was saying about uh, our uh, food consumption, uh, I was watching a TV program the other night. They said uh, the greatest contribution you could make is to avoid any food 
that is transported by air. Oh. And also we are uh, encouraged to uh, avoid or at least reduce our use of beef and, and lamb. These, these animals are ruminants that contribute to global, uh, global warming. Yeah, that, that's the primary concern is cows, but uh, sheep as well, uh, which um, produce methane as they're digesting their food in their rumens and also uh, when they <laughs> fart. And um, methane is an incredibly powerful greenhouse gas. And so they're making a significant contribution to uh, the greenhouse gas concentration in the atmosphere. But we should not be distracted from the fact that we also have to shut down the fossil fuel industry. It's, you know, it's easy to get sidetracked onto eating less meat or doing a bunch of other things, all of which are important, but uh, the number one thing is we have to uh, stop using fossil fuels. Yeah, that's an interesting comment. Uh, uh, sometimes when I'm feeling really cynical, I think that um, doing things like uh, like we just did a little while ago, getting a, uh, a car with EV and so on is kind of feel good stuff. When you think of uh, the massive amount of uh, carbon that's put out by the uh, oil and gas industry, and you, and you see things like uh, Alberta and Saskatchewan that produce most of their electricity by burning coal and natural gas. So, yep. uh, you know, it's, uh, I think in, a, in some way, it, it almost seems like a, like a plot to yeah. let people uh, feel like they're doing good and they're not eating beef and they're driving around a hybrid car, but really, uh, you know where the rubber hits the road and it's, it's, uh, it's with the big industry. Yeah, well, the, the uh, fossil fuel industry loves to promote these kinds of activities. Um, now, the good news is that Alberta's getting rid of most of its coal-fired electrical plants and is converting them to gas. Um, and you know, if you sort of go through the checklist, you can check off a lot of good things that Canada's done. Uh, but if you look at the result, which is greenhouse gas emissions, they're still going up. So everything that we've done has had, uh, have, has done nothing to bring down our uh, annual contribution to the greenhouse gas concentration in the atmosphere. Do you see nuclear power as a, as a good thing? Uh, I'm in favor of including nuclear power in the set of options that we look at. Uh, the uh, most existing nuclear plants are what they call level two technology that was designed in the 1960s. Uh, the nuclear industry says, well, we're now working on level four technology. And in particular, they're excited about what they call modular nuclear plants, which are uh, nuclear plants that individually generate less than 100 megawatts. Uh, the good thing about these new plants is that uh, they have a uh, contained uh, fuel system. Uh, so the, the, the fuel is dispersed in the coolant in a large cylinder, and uh, then they have a heat exchanger that takes the heat that's generated by the fuel in this container, turns it into steam and drives turbines. So uh, technically there's no, cap no capability for these new designs uh, to ever create a critical mass. So you'll never get a Chernobyl type meltdown as a result of them. To me, the, the whole, uh, <laughs> it's, it's really an interesting story because you know, Canada was an early uh, participant in the nuclear industry. We, we built uh, several uh, small nuclear plants. Uh, and in fact, if you look back at the historic designs, uh, these were very similar to the current uh, much lauded uh, modu small modular plants. And we actually sh shipped them all over the world as uh, research tools. But then we got onto the idea that, oh, you know, bigger is better. And so we started building large nuclear facilities to generate electricity. Uh, 
But the fact of the matter is these large facilities like the ones in Ontario are made up of five or six smaller nuclear reactors that are about the size of a modular reactor. The main problem is that the way that the fuel is used to boil water uh, leaves it exposed to a potential uh, escape and meltdown, which the new designs apparently don't do. Uh, but then we went on, you know, we went on, we built nuclear plants all over the world in the um, middle of to the later part of the 20th century. And then because of accidents like Chernobyl, we stopped doing it. Um, recently, uh, this interest in modular plants has got many countries experimenting with nuclear again. They've actually been trying to build a functioning modular plant in uh, Brazil. And in Russia, uh, the Brazilian one was land-based. The Russian one was on a barge. I'm not sure why that was. But they've had great difficulty putting these plants together in anything close to the proposed budget and to get them to work, which makes me scratch my head because the United States and Russia have been building nuclear-powered war vessels for more than a generation. And each nuclear powered war vessel has a small modular reactor as its power source. So why it seems now to be so difficult to uh, recreate that uh, on land is a mystery to me. But uh, that said, I think with the new technology, uh, it should be quite possible to incorporate uh, small scale nuclear, nuclear into, the, into the mix. The problem with wind and solar is the size of the footprint. The terrestrial footprint for those uh, systems is too large for us to be able to put enough of it out there to generate the energy we need to uh, replace all of the fossil fuels. So we need alternatives uh, to wind and solar as well. The one that I'm really in favor of, which never ever gets mentioned, and I don't know why, is geothermal power. I mean, we're, we're all standing here on the biggest thermonuclear plant in the world. It's the world. <laughs> you know, you drill down a uh, few thousand meters, and there's all the heat you need to boil water or any other liquid and drive turbines to make electricity. A uh, few places are developing this. Several countries in Africa, Central America, the United States is a leader in producing uh, energy using geothermal. But it's just not, as yet, part of the equation in most countries. Some countries aren't very suited, but even Europe, uh, which doesn't have uh, a lot of potential for geothermal power, is uh, going along faster than many other countries. Canada has huge geothermal power potential, but it's nowhere in this country. What about tidal? Tidal, definitely, and that's most tidal Power is still experimental. They're doing a lot of work <laughs> off the of Shetlands with various types of, of uh, uh, marine power generation. And a lot of these look quite promising. So I expect that we'll see uh, that starting to be incorporated into the mix. But again, it's a bit like geothermal. Uh, people think of it as science fiction and it's not part of the way in which countries are planning uh, well, I don't know how many countries are actually planning their exit from fossil fuels, and they're being told they have to do it, uh, but there's huge reluctance to really get busy on it. I think the Europeans are ahead of uh, a lot of the, the rest of the world, correct, Mike? Yeah, absolutely right, they are. Uh, European Union has actually dramatically reduced its uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So has Great Britain, in spite of the Brexit and the, all of the <laughs> Tory nonsense there. Um, but even there, you know, the, uh, Germany was doing going great guns. They were uh, installing uh, distributed power systems in in uh, villages and towns all around Germany, mostly wind, but a lot of solar. And uh, local communities were taking great pride in these uh, facilities, this infrastructure to generate power. Um, but uh, you know, the, 
then you come up against the sort of limit of doing that and uh, going the next step uh, was, was a, a big one that was going to cost money and it meant shutting down German coal mines, which were a big generator to the GDP. And so it kind of stalled. And Denmark was the leader in, in Europe for many years. They were uh, decades ahead of everybody else. Uh, but then they did just about everything they could to uh, improve building efficiency, uh, put up solar panels uh, and, and uh, wind, windmills. Uh, but they came up against the uh, big contribution of agriculture to global warming. And they, they had no solution for that. So they kind of stalled. But, you know, we'll get over these roadblocks. And, and I, uh, no, I really honor these countries for taking the problem seriously and doing a great deal uh, in a relatively short period of time. I grew up on the East Coast of England and uh, used to look out to the East, mm -hmm. to uh, Holland and Denmark, and uh, was just the North Sea. Yeah. Now it's just an absolute forest of windmills. Yes. Well, you know, so you have some sense of the footprint of wind farms. Um, and so, you know, being perfectly frank, I think they're uh, visual pollution. So I would much rather see us do other things, at least incorporate uh, other sources of energy that have a much smaller uh, terrestrial and visual footprint than wind farms do. Yeah, I think the controversy is when the windmills are on land, when they're out on the ocean, uh, I mean, there's, there are issues, but. Uh... Uh, yeah, that's true. Uh, but as you said, you know, you stand on the beach where you used to look out at a, a sort of blank seascape. Now it's, uh, there's windmills everywhere. Well, I, you, you're right, but it's actually quite aesthetic to watch them <laughs> spinning around. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> but the big problem with windmills is storage. Yes, um, yeah, they generate power. Uh, but, but we have, uh, the, again, we have the technology. Um, and you know, places like Canada that generate such a high percentage of their electricity with hydropower can be using the power generated by windmills or solar to uh, pump water back up into the reservoir. So the reservoir is the battery. I think another problem with the windmills is uh, the birds collision with bird, uh, birds and bats, isn't it? Yes, uh, although the newer designs with the slower turning blades are much better. They're not a solu complete solution, but the, uh, they claim uh, in the published reports that the numbers of birds that are killed by windmills is much reduced. Uh, and probably right now, uh, lighted skyscrapers are a bigger problem. Yeah. Can I ask a question and uh, make a comment, uh, Michael? Um, since you used Douglas fir as uh, an example in your, your presentation, um, I, uh, I, I wonder how you uh, reconcile um, preservation of old growth Douglas fir when uh, really we're dealing with and, and the effect that wild, wildfire, which predated humans, and uh, pathogens and wind uh desiccated these sites for douglas fir we wouldn't have douglas fir today if the site wasn't desiccated completely and uh, because it only uh, regenerates in, uh, in bare soil and sun yeah so the forest you're looking at uh, are a result of devastation in the past from yeah. wildlife or, or wind or um, pathogens How, would you comment on that Sure. Yeah, the, uh, I'm, as I mentioned, that the lifespan of a Douglas fir is around 800 years, but I don't suppose any Douglas fir or very few ever got close to that. Uh, according to the information that I pulled out, putting this talk together, uh, there used to be a stand killing fire and go through these forests about every 250 years. So they would basically get uh, 
most of the trees killed, and then after a few years, it would fall over. So you'd have a large open space, and that, that was where the Douglas fir could regenerate. Um, and so it was a ecosystem that recycled on a very long cycle period. Um, mm -hmm. And so, what about uh, interior lodgepole pine, which we have very extensive forests of? Yep, same thing. Um, they burn well, of course, with climate change and uh, the drying of uh, certain areas. And you know, again, Douglas fir uh, do best in a particular kind of moisture and thermal environment. So that figure I showed you, projecting where Douglas fir would do well in the future is really based on uh, projected moisture conditions and uh, temperature conditions with climate change over the next 50 years. Uh, mm -hmm. But, you know, all of those places already have forests. And as you rightly point out, uh, Douglas fir don't grow in the shade. So whatever forest is there now is gonna have to disappear before Douglas fir can uh, take hold. Uh, well, that's mm -hmm. partly the basis of my comment that things are going to be very messy for a long time. Uh, they've been messy in the past too, <laughs> but that doesn't change the fact that a mature Douglas fir forest has an amazing biodiversity. And we've had quite a lot of that in the past. We have a lot less now. Um, I'm not um, convinced by the argument that unless we cut down the remaining old growth forest, it's going to do serious harm to our uh, forest economy. In, in theory, uh, over the last 100 years, we've been harvesting our forests on a sustainable basis. But that's not true, because the annual allowable cut has always been greater than the annual increment of increase in forest. If we had been harvesting sustainably, at this stage, we should have a lot of second growth forest to harvest, which we do, but not enough apparently. Anyway, uh, I'm sure this is a discussion we could have for a very long time. <laughs> have I said anything Thank that you. helps? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. One thing I that seems important to me and we're not doing is uh, reducing the use of cars uh, by not just um, changing to electric, which some of us can afford and some can't, and will take a while, but uh, and that doesn't necessarily reduce the numbers, but we're doing next to nothing here on the coast and in the lower mainland and probably a lot of other places about increasing public transit. There's yes. a rail, I believe there's a rail line still existing out from uh, Vancouver to Chilliwack, and that's from decades ago, and that's not being used. We have an inadequate bus system here on the coast and no effort to, to set up uh, park and ride um, uh, areas so that we don't need so many cars. Um, I think there are things like that that need doing as well. I agree completely. I don't have a solution. I mean, when I lived in Vancouver uh, about 15 years ago, uh, we have TransLink, right, in, Van in the Greater Vancouver area. Probably extends over here to Gibsons as well. And uh, at the time, I was working at the Fisheries and Oceans Office in downtown Vancouver, and I lived out near UBC. So I rode the bus every day, and it, it was great. Um, you know, instead of driving my car and looking for a place to park, I could get some reading and work done on the bus. Um, but well, uh, but because I was using the transit system, I paid attention to what they were saying, and uh, it was perennially in financial difficulty. And at one point during this period of a few years, uh, the head of TransLink came on and said, "Well, uh, we're 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 changing uh, the schedules for TransLink. We're eliminating twenty percent of the bus routes, and we're doing this to serve you better." <laughs> and uh, the province nowhere is in Canada, as far as I know, has really come to grips with the. I mean that the, the, the what they would also say is, oh well, when ridership increases, we'll 
mm -hmm. increase the service. Mm -hmm. And um, my sense from reading about transit is you've got to increase the service first and you know eat the cost until people start using the service. And it'll, then it'll start hopefully paying for itself. But to say, well, we'll reduce the service or we'll um, keep it the way it is until more people use it, losing mm -hmm. game. Yeah. Well, Mike, it's um, it's almost nine o'clock, and you've certainly generated a a good discussion tonight. Um, but I have to say, it's with mixed feelings that I thank you for your uh, your presentation, alarming as it was. Uh, you have a wealth of knowledge in this subject. And I, I appreciate uh, a lot of your suggested actions that uh, that we as individuals can take to uh, to save the climate. Um, we all have a job to do. As you said, the future is in our hands. And I, uh, I thank you for reminding us of, uh, of the need to do that. So uh, thank you again, Michael. Very much appreciated. Okay. And uh, as members, we'll certainly look forward to uh, meeting you personally uh, on our uh, on our bird walks and nature walks. Actually, I was thinking of, of going on the tree walk tomorrow. Is anybody mm. else going? Yeah. 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 And anyway, once again, I thank you all for this opportunity. I'm always happy to talk about fish, forests, and biodiversity. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Okay. Thank you. See Thank you, you all next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was lovely. Thank you, Mike. Very good. Thank you. Um